Hello, Animation fans, and welcome to another iAnimate podcast. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez, and you're listening to episode 99. Um, in this episode, we have Ron Smith joining us. Ron is a feature animator who has worked at such studios as Disney, uh, Rhythm and Hue, Sony, and Blue Sky, and on such projects such as Hotel T, uh, Monster House, Tangled, and the Peanuts movie. Um, I have had the neat pleasure uh, to work with Ron here as he was my lead on uh, the Wingfeather Saga uh, animated series. Um, If you followed our podcast, you have heard me probably talk about that. Uh, Really super cool project, neat story, great characters, and it was really an awesome opportunity to work with Ron um, in this uh, capacity and now talk with him uh, in this interview about his past projects and uh, his time here um, on the Wingfeather Saga. So check it out. All right. Well, um, Ron, first of all, I always like to thank my guests. Um, It's always neat to be able to take out some of your time here to uh, talk with you about animation for our guests and stuff. And this was actually, uh, you know, a a unique one for me, having now worked with you uh, on the Wingfeather Saga. So this is super, super cool. And I really just appreciate your time and and taking this with us. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. 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 Looking at your IMDb, you have got a list of great projects that you've worked on, companies that you've worked on, you've or worked with. You've worked with Disney, Blue Sky, Sony. You go all the way back to Veggie Tales, uh, you know, big ideas and things of that nature. So, um, the first thing I like to do is I always like to get into how someone came into this industry. So, how did you get into animation? Um, was it something that kind of sparked you from a younger age? Something kind of come in later, and then how did you get into crafted in this year well as with many animators it's it started by growing up watching cartoons and being just you know every saturday morning (laughs) watching (laughs) watching the cartoons and being glad that they were on the the three channels that were available um but yeah saturday morning was pretty much it um anyway so after high school i i was i knew i wanted to go to college but i didn't know really what for i knew i wanted to i knew i wanted to go into some sort of video production or, or film production. Um, so yeah, th- that's basically what I got my degree in was uh, video production, basically learning how to uh, work in a TV studio, mostly with a film minor, which had a little animation in there too, but uh, it wasn't until my senior year of, of uh, college that I got a, uh, connected with a, a producer who was a former student of one of my current professors in New York, here in, uh, in Manhattan, I'm well, not in Manhattan, but there in Manhattan, um, where I got a summer internship at a place called Telezyn. Um, and I started out as a production intern, which wasn't really quite a good fit for me, but it got me in the building, you know, and then luckily the, the design intern left. <laughs> so I took the picture <laughs> and I actually got a chance to work on a, a storyboard proposal for a uh, major league baseball okay using their their 3d graphics the, the at the time 3d graphics were you know in their in their uh basic state you know mm-hmm. very young industry um but this uh studio was one of the first to start producing commercials and stuff like that. it was mostly flying logos and, and things like that what cool. software was it do you remember might have been soft homage. Okay. I can't remember. We, we yeah, the, our, our place in the company was mostly the, the design and pre-production work of it. So I didn't really have any hands-on animation experience with that. Um, and it wasn't until a couple of years later that I saw a, a course catalog on the, the couch that I shared with a, a bunch of roommates in this flat that, uh, had an animation course available at, at Columbia College in Chicago. So I went for a couple semesters there, um, got something for my reel, which uh-huh. is like a 30 second short of, of Mr. Potato Head uh, performing Hamlet with a peeled potato. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, luckily one of, one of my uh, fellow students had been working at Big Idea Productions, which was working on their second show at the time and uh very kindly offered to, to show me around the studio i brought my re- one reel with me uh-huh. in it uh you know vhs of course and uh got a call the next day from uh 
Chris Olson, who was gotcha. in charge of the whole animation side of things there. And there were six people there at the time and uh, only one other dedicated animator. So that's kind of the beginning of, of where it all started. How you kind of got in there, huh? Yeah. And it, and it really became sort of a garage band mentality of, of what do we want to do? How can we make a dollar out of a dime and, and get the most out of this software? We had, we had to run uh day and night shifts because we only had so many machines. Oh, wow. Of, uh, fortune back then and the software licenses. So I was on uh, the night shift with Tom Dayton way back then. And, uh, yeah, kind of worked that way for a couple of years. And then we moved downtown and uh, the, the studio expanded and expanded and got bigger and bigger. And um, I think we were up, up to like 300 people at one point. Wow. Goodness. Uh, when we were in Lombard, which was, you know, a, a, a mark of the success of the studio and the, the, um, the IP for sure. We were showing, yeah, the property we were showing. So, um, and that led to, um me kind of teaching myself how to animate which i came to learn in in later years um working among the the bona fide artists <laughs> the studios, <laughs> that it's a lot different when you know learning the fundamentals and and getting the 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 basic ideas in your head for it and i, I kind of worked my way around them by trying to you know read illusion of life and all the all the great books but there you know there were no animation schools back then so everybody was kind of self-taught um and if you didn't come from a, a 2d background you know cgi animation kind of enabled you to to jump in without being an, an expert draftsman yeah, you know, yeah, yeah for sure my big uh hurdle to get over so what i love about that too is um you know, that was probably how many years ago, if you don't, if you don't mind dating. 93. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So about 30 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then here, you know, like I said, I've got to work with you on the wing feather saga, which was working with Chris and uh, Keith, you know, um, Lingo on this here. Um, and here it is all these years later who, you know, you worked with on uh, at veggie tales and things of that nature here. 30 years later, you're still working with it. And just, it's always cracks me up about how small, you know, the industry is, even though it's worldwide, you know? It really is. Yeah. And and you get to know. So, yeah. And I kind of consider myself kind of the Forrest Gump of, of the animation industry where I'm kind of in the right place at the right time. I'm surrounded by all these brilliant artists and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad I'm, I've been able to <laughs> this ride. You know? Um, but it was, it was back at, uh, big idea when we started the three, two, one penguins okay. project, uh, that, that Keith joined the team and a lot of other, uh, really big names in, in animation today, uh, were there as well. Um, and it, it was that same kind of garage mentality of, uh, we want to make this show. Our characters have limbs now, uh -huh. you know, it's the most economical way to get this done and uh we did we did kind of uh <laughs> get beyond our budgets occasionally um but you know it was it was all just trying to figure out how to do things and now that we're coming back around and kind of getting the band back together you know 20 20 years later or so it uh we we do kind of know what we're doing yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, but there's still there's the added aspect of uh, like Unreal Engine uh -huh. having being factored into the, the big equation. Um, there, there still is a certain amount of figuring stuff out. Yeah, figuring, feeling around, and and sticking with what works and uh, improving what doesn't. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely want to get into more of the Wing Feather Saga stuff uh, that we got to work on. So we'll kind of work up to that. Sure. Um, so that way you were from New, you're from New York, you moved over to Actually, Chicago. I, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. In okay. Cincinnati, um, went to school in Ohio then had the internship in New York and then moved to Chicago. Um, a couple years after that, where I, I didn't go directly into animation. I worked on a couple of, uh, feature films back then. I don't, I don't know if those are in my bio anymore, but yeah, like Hoffa. And uh, um, 
Little Man Tate. <laughs> a couple of obscure films uh-huh. that were really fun to work on. You know? That's cool. And that was um, back in Chicago? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, Chicago and Cincinnati. Okay. But then, yeah, then school kind of took over and, and big idea started my career. So Gotcha, gotcha. Um, from there, uh, the studio had sort of a confluence of, of crucial events that uh, one was a lawsuit for uh, property rights. Um, one was the, the actually 9-11 was kind of a culprit. <laughs> really? Yeah, well, just the timing of our, of our first feature release and, and the effect on, I don't know, just the... the yeah, the, whole the, country, the, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, the, the studio had to close down, unfortunately. Gotcha, okay. So that was the, the first studio I closed. <laughs> um, hey, I gotta tell you though, you would not be the first one that I've done an interview with where it's been, yes, yeah, so I was at that studio, then that one closed down. I went to this other studio where you know, I'm like, I'm kind of following, you know, a little pattern here now, but he's like, <laughs> that's part of the industry. You never, you know, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it, it is a business. And yeah. That's, that's kind of the bottom line. And, uh, you know, as artists, we can all strive for the best and hope for the best, but it, it really does come down to, down to the, 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 the numbers. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway. Um, so, so when that closed, what did you do from there? It was like time to go West and okay. uh, move to LA. Um, so, uh, the, the summer before we moved, I went to SIGGRAPH and just hit all the booths of, of all the studios out there and um, ended up getting a, a my first job in L.A. at Rhythm and Hughes. Okay. What was that on? Um, that was, the uh, first one was Scooby-Doo 2. Okay. Which rolled over into Garfield. Um, and those were great. Those were my first, uh, that was my introduction into live action integration, you know, the the cg character in a live action plate uh-huh. so there's a lot to learn about that side of things and uh sort of the, the beginning of, of vfx uh branch of, of you know uh video production right um, but after that the the crew was was shrunk and uh i got a couple of freelance jobs between there and uh joining Sony, uh, Sony Imageworks uh-huh. on um, uh, Monster House. Okay. Which was the introduction to the true mocap. Right, right. Now, why did they go mocap with that one? Because I know when I was talking with you, what other production was on at the same time or real close? Um, open season. Okay. They were going parallel. And, and it was part of Sony's uh, three-legged plan of having a VFX wing, uh, a feature animation wing and then a, a mocap wing and it okay. was led by sort of robert zemeckis's passion for that that approach and uh you know monster house was was directed by one of his protégés and it was really interesting because you know back then mocap was so new and and but it involved um actually filming the actors on a stage and and working as an ensemble which was one of the ex- unexpected uh, things that really appealed to me is, is that it wasn't just people standing in a booth. Gotcha. Talking to a microphone, being edited together afterward. It had this really natural. And on top of that, you had this sort of uh, living 3D Moybridge study of, of how little kids just moved and they're all jangly and how, how the, the characters would run and the, the tall skinny kid would have this certain kind of <laughs> floppy way of running. <laughs> you could just orbit around them and study. It was really, it was really cool. And that's so, cool. And then on any job, you kind of look for, look for the bright side of things. Uh-huh. You know, I, I kind of bummed out. I wasn't working on open season because that seemed like the cool project, but I learned a lot on uh, monster house and, and had a really good time too. That's cool. Yeah. I've had some, I've had some other interviews with some of the guys that have worked in, um, games in and, and working with mocap and that was a very similar experience just talking about how their body mechanics were mm-hmm. just honed in because they have this life footage here and they're doing the same thing kind of really 
figuring out, oh, this is what's happening here at this time. Yeah. So again, kind of going back to your your point, taking what can I take from this to grow as an artist? Mm -hmm. And and it was it was interesting, sort of reverse unanimating all the all the mocap data that you would get. It would, it would be unusable just because it was you know not as clean right as it was yeah as clean yeah. As these days i guess but uh you know you, you, you'd know what to recognize and you'd, you'd pick your key poses and and figure it out so it was really interesting and gotcha glad to have a couple of those kinds of opportunities uh throughout the years with sony but also the the feature animated the keyframe animation jobs were my most favorite ones of right course. right yeah uh, um yeah just that that kind of you know, Pixar was was getting all the the, the limelight, deservedly. Right, you know, doing great things, great innovative things with you know fur and water and all these things. Um, but it was nice to be on sort of the, the the fringier side with Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs that had a chance to be more stylized and, and and more playful and and goofier. Yes, and uh, you know the directors um, Phil Lord and, and Chris Miller. Or just so open in in dailies, we just sit around cracking wise and what if we did this? What if we did this? One ideas around it just get better and better. Uh, yeah, well, that's one of my all time favorite movies because of just the quirkiness in it. I absolutely yeah. love it. Well, it, and and because of that uh, sort of dynamic behind the scenes, that it's one of my favorite movies that I've ever worked on. So, gotcha. Uh, the the good vibes kind of surround and sustain with that one yeah, <laughs> really good um, so you know a monster house would that would that got you into the door with sony mm -hmm. or, or was it some of the other ones like uh scoob and stuff or scooby uh, you know how it is you, you you put your latest thing on your reel and you you hope that propels you towards where you want to go right um, yeah that that's kind of when it was becoming less of oh we're at a studio it's nice we'll just move on to the next project to where you started to have to kind of audition for the next show. Gotcha. Figure out what you were going to do after that, um, which in in a good way led to working on shows like Tangle. Right. Working at Disney for a while. Yeah. Um, which was just such a, an overwhelming experience when I look back on it. And, and I, I was kind of starstruck, you know, being there at first and, you know, there's there's Glenn Keane over there, and you know, uh, just all the all the the big time animators. You know? Right, right. And, uh, yeah, I just learned a ton. I I felt like I was kind of swimming as hard as I could <laughs> the whole time, and uh, yeah, it was just it was it was an amazing experience. No, I know Tangled. Um, that was a very short production in regards to what had to be accomplished from that time. So I'm, right. I'm sure there was a lot of challenges in regards to OT and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things that you felt like, uh, you know, I have an athletic background. I've talked about this before. I always try to think about, okay, what do I take from this match or what, you know, that kind of, I take for the next one here. What was something that you look back during your time on Tangled, working with guys like Glenn Keane or maybe the other artists there that you were like, man, this is something I really grew in as an artist. Well, I, looking back, I I, I I tried as best as I could, but I feel like I, I could have um, asked for more help, not help necessarily, but, uh, you know, just advice from, from people and uh, not being as, um, reluctant, I, you know, I don't want to bother them. They're gotcha. really going to do, but they're just like us where we're, we're glad to, uh, give our two cents and, and uh, benefit of our experience and all that stuff, um, to younger animators. So I, you know, that, that's something I took from there was to ask, ask for more help. You gotcha. Know, ask around and, uh, talk to the other animators more, you know, yeah. What were some of the things you learned from Glenn as he maybe drew over your shots and things of that nature? It was tricky because he had a very 2D style and it wasn't necessarily the the explicit drawing that he did. It was just kind of that feeling that you, you had to absorb from whatever he, he was showing you. So it was it was less 
one to one, and it, you know that that's kind of the way it is with any notes that the intent behind it, rather than gets and and ones that I've given. It's like, well, I you know I don't I, I don't want this exactly <laughs> partly because I can't draw that well, <laughs> I can't draw that accurately. It looks just like this, but also because it's it's it is just more of a feeling. The the timing and spacing of stuff that. Uh, um, yeah, it's just it's it's all a matter of interpretation, you know, and and it's just getting your interpretation in tune with what the director wants or the the supervisors. Want, I guess. Gotcha, gotcha. It's, it's not easy, but it's you know something is that artists have to do. Right. When they're, when they're hired to animate for a show, you all have to be on the same wavelength. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So from Tangled uh, at Disney there, um, it looks like you worked on some other projects after that before you yeah. jumped back to uh, Sony. and um, Yeah, I, I did a couple of uh, freelance jobs from home, which was kind of kind of unheard of back then. Okay. Know? It was a lot of more for real effects down in Dallas uh -huh. that uh, they had the, the remote setup thing going way you know as early as as that so gotcha um that was fun you know did a did a piece for nvidia kind of showing off their real-time at uh real-time rendering engine um which again it, it, it's all kind of coming back, <laughs> coming back into unreal engine uh -huh. yeah everything everything rhymes <laughs> so uh but the, yeah, then I then went back to Sony for some uh, Hotel T. Yeah, Hotel T was was the last uh, Sony project I worked on before moving out to uh, New York and uh, Blue Sky, which is fun. Um, it, it just kind of out of the blue, I got a call from from somebody at Blue Sky. I was just wondering if I'd ever thought of, of moving to the, the East Coast, and it was at a point. Um, in LA where I was feeling like, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to hustle for each job that comes next, or I could, I could uproot my whole family <laughs> move across the country and uh, have a little more stability, which, you know, talked about that a lot. And, you know, <laughs> but it was, um, you got on in, uh, looks like Epic. So there uh -huh. was, how long were you at Blue Sky then? I, I guess I was going to say there was years. some stability for a while. Well, of course. And, and it, uh, you know, I, I'm basically uh, stationed somewhere every nine years. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, the first big idea was about nine years. Moving out to LA was about nine years. And then uh, Blue Sky started on Gotcha. Epic. And that was, uh, again, just sort of that you're thrown into a new studio everybody else knows each other and you're, you're trying to get into the mix of things and and figure out your place in the, in the department and everything um but that it was so great everybody there was amazing and uh just very welcoming and and supportive and yeah just helped me enjoy my whole nine years there it was gotcha. great now, each studio tends to have kind of their own um, flavor or DNA. What was it that uh, that you would kind of describe your time at Blue Sky? Hmm. Just the the cohesiveness, I guess. You okay. know, the, the there's um, you know being in being in the same department and studio with with so many other great artists. Um, yeah, it, it really got to be. Um, fun to go to work and and uh yeah I, it, it it was just a very comfortable place um it, you know the, the the surroundings were more like where i grew up in the midwest so that that sort of familiarity kind of went beyond the studio gotcha um yeah it was it was it was just a very comfortable studio to be to be in and, and we're part of any favorite movies that you worked on during that time there um yeah I'd, I'd say the the peanuts movie was a blast um just just because it was so different from everything else okay and the way that had to be 
approached to, to stick with um, Charles Schultz's, you know, very unique graphic style. Right. Um, for example, we, we only had like six basic head angles that we could use and, and the geometry of the heads would have to change between each of those rigs. So it, it, it required a lot of planning and uh, you know, figuring out how the, how the character was even going to turn his head. You know? <laughs> so was it so, different rigs or was there sliders that were would uh, modify the geometry? Basically, kind of kind of both. You know, okay. different different rigs in the same setup. So you would okay. have to remove one character and bring in another one. Okay. 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 It, it would it would still be part of it, but that rig would change things about your your character that uh were different in the, in the previous version gotcha previous. gotcha okay so, the reason why i ask is um i had an opportunity to work on scoob um the one that came out we did a lot of the the um uh, advertisement for it and such yeah. and there was two different rigs for the scoob the adult scooby character um Hind when he was walking versus when he was walking mm -hmm. on all yeah. fours so that's why i didn't know if there was different rigs in that sense but you had to switch the character yeah yeah depending case, on yeah all pretty tricky yeah yeah <laughs> but we didn't have to do that but yeah we we would they had different kinds of arms like if you if you look at a peanuts cartoon it's mainly just their forearm and uh -huh. that, that you ever see unless their arm is straight down and so each the way the fingers were set up and and arranged and proportionate and yeah, just everything would change. From so, okay, which I guess doesn't sound too bad. Like you said, it just depends on how you plan. But as we all know, things change in a shot. So what that, that would be difficult then if you've got things that are planned out, you work things out, and they're like, oh, well, what if we did this? And now you're like, okay, now I've got to, you know, adjust yeah, it, this. Bit. It meant you had to go into it. Uh, go into your idea with other ways of explaining it to the, to the supervisor or the director. And okay. Most of the, most of the animators would just do it with drawings because it was, it was faster and easier uh, to do with drawings. And we all had, uh, you know, peanuts drawing lessons that we had to. Oh, really? Do. Yeah. I've got a whole sketchbook just full of really bad <laughs> Charlie Brown. And, and and, <laughs> so we, we had to get the, the, the definite look of everything really ingrained in our heads to know what would be wrong with whatever modifications we were doing gotcha. uh, on, on the spot. So like down to the little parentheses lines, around uh -huh. our lines, you know, when do you use those? Well, you gotta, probably should use those for this, this expression, you know, gotcha, gotcha. Like that, or the, his, his pupils are just a little bit too tall or just really infinitesimal things that, that, Charles Schultz could pull off with just a touch of his pen. And uh, it just takes all <laughs> these computer guys so much time and effort to, to really extract that, that kind of uh, simplicity, I guess. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. So you had to get good enough at drawing to communicate, to convey your ideas to the supervisor then? Yeah, 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 gotcha. pretty much. And, uh, you know, from there it was just, Pretty, pretty straightforward blocking and, and getting stuff in there. And part of the pressure was taken off because this is how they all walk. You know, if you watch a, a Peanuts cartoon, they all kind of walk the same with the, their feet doing the same timing and the same posing and all that stuff. So you could kind of use a generic version of all that stuff, but it was, it was mostly the, the posing of the face and, and body to, to convey the ideas the best way so gotcha and i gotta imagine too just the nostalgia of getting to work on something as iconic as this i i have a a little plush snoopy dog that i've uh -huh. had since i was uh six years old <laughs> nice my, my total upbringing was was peanuts you know it was, yeah it was, and they were pretty dominant uh, on the on the scene just because. yeah you know, the, the prolific coverage of, of you know, Sno Snoopy went on the space. I mean, yeah. <laughs> cool stuff in real life. So, 
don't know. Yeah, I, I, I've been a Peanuts fan for my whole life. So. Gotcha. No, that's awesome. That's very cool. Was there an extra weight of pressure working on something that, that was that had such uh, nostalgia, or did you guys feel like once we hit this, oh, we got it, we, and we've we've established what we were looking for? There, there, there was pressure on myself to not say Charlie Brown wouldn't do that, or that wouldn't happen in a Charlie Brown cartoon. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I felt like I had some some sort of expertise, especially the whole reveal of the little redheaded girl. I uh-huh. was, yeah, we can't do that. We can't do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Charles Schultz will be rolling in his grave right now. Yeah. Well, that, that was kind of one of the other things was uh, working with the, the Schultz family and uh, trying to get the, the their their wishes worked into the film as well. So, you know, there was, there was pressure from within to get it to look right and pressure from outside to, to get certain things more, more Schultz. Schultzified, I guess. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, I think all in all, it turned out pretty good. Yeah, very cool. Okay, so now you know we uh, you got to work all the way up to uh, Ferdinand Spies in Disguise. Um, that was your last one at Blue Sky. Uh, yeah, there's the the scratch short that they okay. did right at the very end that that wasn't even done uh, before the, the announcement came out, but. Uh, yeah, we stuck around and finished that one off. So, put it on Disney Plus. But uh, yeah, Spies in Disguise was the last feature we worked on, and we were getting ready to make um, Nimona, which was shaping up to be uh, an amazing project. And I can't wait to see it come out. A uh, number of the uh, animators that started on it in at Blue Sky uh, continued were with it. Lucky enough to be on the. the final production of it so i'm eager to see how they did it and uh yeah it how was, true it, it stays to what you guys did and and or varied off i'm sorry what so are you it, you think it'll stay pretty true to what was happening there at blue sky or i have, I have no idea um the same directors were were carried over as well um so i don't know why it would be much different okay um, but yeah I'm, I'm really eager to see what what uh what it turned out like gotcha <laughs> Really sorry I didn't get to work on it. Too. <laughs> now, how um, surprising was the news at Blue Sky in regards to the shutting down? It, it was kind of out of the blue sky, you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> One afternoon when, uh, yeah, there was an all hands meeting, and and that was that. So yeah, it was it was it was a real bomb when it when it went off. But you know, um, they did give us, you know about six weeks to kind of taper off and, and look for another job. And um, for a lot of people that meant now's my chance. Now I can finally move up or move on or move on, you know, move on to something else. Um, in my case, you know, my kids are in, in the high school here. Right. Kind of uh, established. established here at this point. Um, so it was, it was just, uh, Good fortune that uh, the, the, the voices from the past came back, and <laughs> uh, you know I've heard about this other project that actually uh, Mike Naraki, the the voice of Larry the Cucumber, uh-huh. was the first guy who got in contact with me about um, the wing feather. Now, now, what is his involvement with it? Uh, he's he's not. He's just he just yeah. He's gotcha, he's, gotcha. You know. In, in, He's involved with all things Bob and Larry, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, he, he got me connected with Chris Wall and, and uh, Andrew Peterson, and we talked for a while, and it, it just felt like a really good fit. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the, it, it was at a point where I was – you know, there's, there's a certain level of desperation when I got to find a job, got to find a job. And I did, I did, I worked on uh, uh, God of War in the okay. interim and uh, had a great time doing that because that, that let me rejoin with uh, a couple of old friends from uh, Sony Gaming. Sony. And uh, yeah, it, that's, that's always a, a kind of a fun other thing to do, you know, right. because it has the, um, 
sort of technical side of things that I, I don't get experience, much experience on. Um, and just the, the, the detail of the facial mocap and everything just, you know, it, it uh, finds a good place in my head just working on stuff like that. But it, it's great to be able to, to get back into animating, even though uh, I, haven't done, <laughs> I haven't done much animating for, for wing feather yet. Um, just sort of giving giving the reviews and everything that uh, comes with the, the lead position. But uh, Right, right. And so for those that don't know, um, I think I've mentioned this on a couple podcasts. I got to work on the Wing Feather Project, the Wing Feather Saga, ep uh, season one, um, for about five months, and Ron was my lead. Um, and I've done a podcast with Keith Lango before, um, when he was one of our instructors here at iAnimate, and uh, he's the... What was his title? Super uh, supervising CG or CG yeah. supervisor, something like that. Yeah. Um, Executive producer. Okay. He's, he's he's really is the brains and and aesthetic behind everything. It's amazing. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just his background, you know, being at Valve and things of that nature, both on the technical and artistic standpoint. Um, so yeah, it was just a really cool project to get to work on. But I'd like to hear what for you made you want to to work on it was it partly the convenience of being able to stay where you're at the... so many different things yeah okay it, kind of starting there um yeah I've, I've i've moved into my basement had my my um animation studio set up down here and, and it, it's I, I was working from home prior to that with both the, the sony job and and blue sky you know since covid um so that was one thing that I didn't have to move back out west or, or anything like that. So right. that was one thing that I feel. mainly though it was, and I, I wasn't familiar with the with the the book series before this at all. And uh, but after talking to Andrew and Chris and and learning about their approach to the the adaptation of the books, it, it just made so much sense. And everything that, that we talked about was like yeah that, that that's a great way to do that that's that's a, a brilliant approach to to that problem whatever right. it was. and um being able to reconnect with keith and work with him again because i i've been vaguely aware of his uh career up to that point but it really was the two of us working together really hard back at big idea and then going our own ways for you know 25 years <laughs> and coming back together with just all, all that experience behind us and, yeah. and being in that same situation of, okay, what do we do now? But having that, that, that knowledge of, oh, well, we could try this or we could do it this way or, you know, and even um, being able to rely on, on the younger animators for the latest tools or, or approaches to things that, you know, in our, in our old man, <laughs> so it's, we, haven't, we haven't experienced that much and the the independence of the whole crew uh, is is amazing you know i'm always um just in awe at, at how well everybody overcomes obstacles gotcha they, they take it on themselves or they they ask the group and, and it's just uh really impressive and and uh, just make me feel good about the way it's been accomplished and everything uh, what's been accomplished and, and the way that a studio can the, the dynamic can work you know because yeah in, yeah in other contexts you you get the feeling that you're you're a lot more um guarded and you're kind of protecting your your secret chops gotcha you know? gotcha gotcha the more I work with this crew, it's it's more like, yeah, here's all. Oh, I never, I never even thought of that. So, <laughs> that's been amazing. Um, just the, the the way that uh, Keith has has combined Maya with um, Unreal Engine. Unreal. Yeah. He's, and a lot of this, I, I get the sense, is something that Keith has just wanted to do you know, for a long time, that right. he's these ideas and now this is his chance to do it. And it's such a great, um, book source material, right. Um, that just raises everything else up 
another level. Right? Yeah. You know, you're seeing more and more of that um, departure from the, the, the traditional CGI character design and, and environmental, how, how everything's done or how everything has been done. Right. And, and the sort of identifiers of, oh, this is a, this is a good movie because it's got these qualities about it. Right, right. You know, it, it, stuff is coming out that just looks janky and sloppy, but it, it works. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Because of that experimentation and, and, you know, a lot of trial and error. And even, even on the Wingfeather saga, the, the first couple of episodes are really good, but all the ones that came after those are even better. And yeah, yeah. And you know, maybe we can go back and, and fix up a couple of things. And they're they're mostly technical uh, things that that Unreal didn't like about Maya. You know. And yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That would affect things on a on a technical way, but it like how it uh, rendered and things like that. Yeah, yeah, how it rendered the frame rate and everything not not yeah. quite matching up. So having to okay this is this is the best it looks for you know for now um, yeah but that's also one of the advantages of streaming is that it's not just a thing that's out there it's this thing that's out there you for now but we, <laughs> we can, we can a little bit you know, yeah yeah where we can do. they won't notice but they'll notice anyway um, well, i i came across the project uh my my wife had read um the books to uh some of our older kiddos and uh, then I saw Keith had uh, was working on this, and she's like, "Honey, if you can get on this project, like, <laughs> do it." So I hit him up, and I was like, "Hey, I'm a big fan. I think I'd read the first book at the time." And I said, "My my kids, my kids, and my wife literally paced out the last book because mm -hmm. typically you want to devour it, right? It's like, oh, I can't. They literally paced it out because they knew that was the last book. They're like, I don't want to get done yeah. with it. Yeah." And uh, so, yeah, if you've not read these books, it's called The Wing Feather Saga, fantastic stories. And uh, one of the things I like that we did here with this project too is um, for those that are avid readers, movies can always feel like, hey, I did, it didn't live up to the book, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things I've really realized is because it's such a different medium, with books, you're limited to just words, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. With, in film, you've got lighting, you've got color, you've got a subtle acting that we, you know, we can portray with no words and then you've got dialogue, right? So even with the dialogue, you've got to keep it in a, do it in a way that doesn't feel like I'm literally narrating it to you, you know? And so it becomes a very yeah. different medium for that, uh, that reason. So we change things too. Right. And, and that's, that's by necessity. The, the other side of that coin is that in a book, you can, you can read a person's mind. You know, right. You, every thought that that character is saying is, thinking and you know learn about their relationship with the other characters and all that you know just that internal monologue um you, you can't do that in a show unless you have a narrator which right we don't need uh, <laughs> i hope but uh it, it is it is a balancing act between um figuring out what the uh the audience for the books will enjoy seeing but keeping it new and, and kind of um, consolidating the right, right things in the story and elaborating on the other things about the story that, that kind of makes sense going forward and, and propel you into that story. Yeah. Yeah. Because in the first half hour of any series, you're just, you're world building, you're, you're telling the audience what this place is. And we're lucky to have such a, a broad fan base for the books that i i didn't know about you know i didn't know, yeah. I didn't know about the fans but yeah they're they're something else they're um really on board and they they do have very uh in-depth discussions that i think about <laughs> you know, well, I left this out of the book well i think that's okay because it, it sends you along this way and you hear them talking about a lot of the things that that those of us actually making these changes have discussed and, right try to figure out the best approach to those things so it, it really is a dang and i've never been on a, a project that has such an interactive relationship with their audience you gotcha know, the way that uh chris and, and andrew and everybody are willing to show off half done work you know because they know the fans are, are 
you know, eager to see that behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Stuff, you know, and it, yeah. it doesn't make us look like we don't know what we're doing. It's just, here's a really early stage. This is what our animators see while they're working. And and it gives them a, an even closer connection to the to the show, I think. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I really enjoyed as well, um, and maybe you can kind of allude more to this, is that... Um, and you kind of did a little bit beforehand, just the um, collaborative process that we had with artists that were remote and literally from all over the world. Um, we had a few of us from the U.S., uh, some from Mexico, some from uh, yeah, the Czech Republic. Czech Republic, you know. Um, yeah, all over the place. And yeah, different time zones that we were working on, but it just, it worked. It just worked. It really, yeah, and that that speaks to the the, I don't know, generosity of, of spirit of the whole team that they're they're willing to kind of you know I, it means i have to get up a little earlier so that i can get be as much a, a part of the the people who are six hours earlier be as much a part of their day as i can be right and uh yeah the time zone thing was a <laughs> kind of a big adjustment um but yeah having so many um different perspectives and different voices on this project has, has been invaluable. And, uh, you know, a couple of the artists have, have a stronger mocap kind of background. So I, I can kind of wrap my head around how they're approaching their work and others have more of a, you know, I'll, I'll sketch in my ideas for, so at, at, at first I was trying to, uh, suggest strongly that people, follow a, a particular form of, of progress because our, our timeline on, on our, uh, our output levels are so high. Yeah. It's so, there's so much footage in such a short time, it, it limits the amount of interaction we can have back and forth between reviewer and, and artist. Um, but it, I'm getting off track here. But so my, my first approach was to say, you know, if you follow this, this method of doing things, I think things will go along a lot faster, but people were struggling to get on board with those ways. And, and we found that once those uh, uh, instructions were, were loosened a little bit, that uh, things started flowing a, a little better. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of back to that, whatever it takes, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make it work. Yeah. Because one of the things that I felt like would have been nice, um, more for the collaborative process, but I don't think it just would have worked. It would have been nice to have more of the um, interactive dailies. Because mm -hmm. yeah, yours, we're yours were recorded. Yeah, yours were recorded, um, which was also nice because you, you always address something afterwards. But one of the things that you did really well, too, was instead of just trying to give notes, you would do a video. Hey, this is what I'm kind of thinking. It kind of goes back to what we we're talking about, even with Glenn Keane. Hey, this mm. is I'm, I'm not looking for this specifically, but this is kind of why, um, you know, I'm thinking of this route here, you know. Yeah. And so you did a lot of videos, I think, which worked well for people on different time zones because we could always address those as needed here and it was a great information yeah that that was one of the big adjustments when when COVID had us all staying home was uh the inability to to gather as a group and and have everybody sort of ch chiming in as as dailies it it made dailies a lot more productive and and uh fruitful for for more ideas to be in the mix and it's just the way it is, you know, it, it, it's mainly a monologue for me up until the point where it's, it's me and Keith. And then, uh, you know, it's, it's the best way we can get through things. And, you know, I it started out a, a little awkward, just me be talking to myself, <laughs> figuring out the best way to, to convey my ideas um, back and forth. But yeah, I mean, we, we seem to have gotten in sync and, and, uh, yeah. Was there anything that, um, you know, coming back from uh, uh, such big studios like Blue Sky and Disney, uh, Sony, that surprised you in working in a smaller studio like this and with people from all over the world on different time zones? What, what was the, for your vantage point, some of the um, surprises, both pros and cons? Yeah. One of the biggest cons was was finding out how little 
technical knowledge I have myself and how reliant I had become on the studio's IT okay. department to fix stuff for me and, and you know, give me all the, the tools and programs and everything I needed. And here you're thrown in into a void. And it's like, okay, start filling it up with, with your ideas and your approaches and your, your ways of doing things and build this pipeline. Um, so for the very very beginning of pre-production, it, it was kind of a flailing around, you know, maybe this will work and hopefully, hopefully this will help. And it wasn't until all the artists started going through the process and, and working out the, the bugs in the, in the pipeline and everything and giving their feedback to us and us trying to make the adjustments uh, to make things work better and more efficiently. But it really is the independence of all the uh, international artists that, uh, again, it's just, it's amazing how well and how uh, such a high output of, of such good animation, you know? I, I, I feel like in hindsight, I was, I was really pushing the artists to get, get better and better despite this the crushing, you know. Quota and everything. Quota, yeah. Um, but I, I was never disappointed, you know. They right, don't right. Yeah, it's, it, and it shows. And I'm so glad to be at the end of season one, going into season two and getting everything ready and, and uh, hopefully having a, a more graceful start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was one of the things I did notice with the artists. Many of them had read the books. Many of them were familiar mm -hmm. with it. Um, and there was already an investment um, coming yeah. in as animators versus jumping into something that's a brand new IP and kind of getting the ball rolling in, in who the characters are and um, – Versus now, at the end of this, you know, at the end of the pr uh, project, you're like, oh, I've really fell in love with the characters, and that there was already that beforehand. It seemed like with a lot of the artists, and, mm -hmm. and if it wasn't right off the bat, it was pretty dog on quick. Um, yeah. I know a lot well, of them started, I, like I said, reading the books and things like that. So, yeah, I, there was already that passion, I guess. You're right. You're right. Absolutely. And I, I kind of had to play catch up myself, you know, reading the books as, as quickly as I could, and. and it's this second and third rereading that I'm, I'm finally able to extract things uh, just you know, one or two sentences that, that tell how a character does something and, and take that from the book and apply it to this specific scene. You know, this, this is from the book. This is where this character's head is in this moment. So, you know, the artists have that to keep in mind now, hopefully gotcha. that'll help. Yeah, yeah. Too. but uh, yeah, it, it, it is a matter of getting to know the characters, of course, and, uh, you know, just figuring out their little idiosyncrasies and uh, their, their characterizations, you know. Uh, Was there any favorite characters you had that because of that? Uh, well, I, I kind of ended up liking Slarb's maniacal, just okay. his progression of, of understanding. <laughs> you know, he started out as just kind of the Weasley uh you know not not a villain but he he's just consumed by this mania this vendetta against uh -huh. him and uh he's just doing it for his own you know his own sense of retribution but it has impacts on the whole story you know yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. that inciting incident that uh you know the the family takes off on this giant adventure so <laughs> yeah, i don't know I like Slarp. I like I like <laughs> all the characters. You know, each, each one has has their moment of oh, that's that's a great little moment there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. One of the other things I like that we did with this <laughs> project is we got good chunks of sequences, um, and that seemed to kind of play pretty well with the flow of uh, continuity, both as well as the timing that uh, for our quota. Um, but it felt like there was a, a nice uh, progression that we were able to kind of get because we had such, uh, you know, maybe six sequences or something like that mm -hmm. and really kind of plan that out, really kind of get that flow in. Um, from when yeah, that, that was one of the evolutionary uh, approaches to the pipeline that uh, 
kind of bore itself out that uh, it just made more sense to to give bigger chunks to each animator. Yeah, they could have that flow, and it and that's something you just don't see in bigger productions. Um, but it it also meant that you had to have a real, really solid idea of what was happening throughout the whole sequence, not just on the on the handoffs. You know, the, right. The trade-off cut. So, you know, that, that that's just another amazing aspect of, of how uh, dedicated these these artists were. And kind of remembering what I was going to say earlier, the, the the way it was back at Big Idea, where you would be um, staying up late at night just to make sure that the render of what you animated two days ago get got done, because uh -huh. it would take a couple of minutes at, at the least. The, the very basic equipment we have so the the round the clock uh, the around the clock uh you know dedication that that the studio was showing was more to to overcome the technological shortcomings of of how long it takes to produce one one show right Whereas now it's like we want to make it look we have ways to, to render things super quickly. So now all that effort is going into making it look better and making mm -hmm. the performances uh, ring truer. And, and just that it's more of a, uh, an artistic dedication, um, both to the story material and um, the graphic aspects of the show, rather yeah. than, you know, we've got to hurry through this part of the production because actually assembling things and, and rendering things is going to take a month. Right. So it's like uh, just the ability to, to expand on the, the creative input rather than. Right. Input, just the technical. Yeah, getting things done. is very liberating. Yeah. Yeah. Know. Yeah. It, it, again, it's, it's just sort of the, 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 the changing of the, the, way that the productions get done and the uh, incorporation of, of new technology or whole new approaches that, you know, I, I it, it makes me kind of glad that, that the, the kick out of the nest <laughs> yeah. guy closed down just provided this great opportunity to, to have such a great experience. On Very show. cool. Very cool. Um, We'll kind of wrap it up. I got some questions uh, just kind of off the cuff. Uh, any favorite characters you've got to work on that if you're like, hey, if I could go back and work on this character again, I would just love to. It'd be so much fun. Um, I think Rapunzel. Okay. You know, I, I, I feel like I, I was, um, again, swim, swimming upstream as hard as I could. <laughs> Try to keep up with the... With the amazing work that everybody else was putting in there. And uh, yeah, I, I, I look back on that character and, and, and watch the film and it's like, wow, this, this is such a great character. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Just got a lot of heart that was kind of new for the, for the animated features as well, or for Disney animated features. Yeah. Yeah. Princess heroine that, uh, you know, just a, a, a new feeling towards that uh, setup. But yeah, Rapunzel would have been nice to go back to um, looking around at the posters. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Any of your least favorite characters that when you had to open up a scene, you're like, oh, okay, I got to well, got my work out yeah. for me on this one or, and, and it may, may have just been because maybe it wasn't, you know, maybe the most fun one or because maybe the most uh, challenging. I, I, yeah. I would say that the quadrupeds, in uh like ferdinand for example okay everybody was on all you know four feet so just just the challenge of adding that complexity math of making it look right and have an extra set of legs and, <laughs> i don't know that, all, that always kind of complicated things for me um so i i felt lucky to get a talking headshot okay gotcha <laughs> there okay that's good i don't have to make a walk around <laughs> i'd look at the work and of other people when he's you know moving through the town and everything and just oh, 
can't see. I, I can't understand how they're able to get it to look so good. So, <laughs> no. You learn. Any, any favorite, um, for lack of a better term, not typecasted, but what what are kind of some of your favorite shots to work on? Body mm. mechanics, up close, acting, subtle, comedy, you know. Yeah, I, I got to say that comedy shots are the the most rewarding for me just because I like to crack wise about stuff so much. And a lot of the shots that were my favorite to work on were ones that were kind of blank slates where, we, you know, it starts like this, it ends like this. This has to happen in the middle, but, you know, what that is, is, is up to you. And, and there are a couple of, couple of shots like that in peanuts that I felt really good about how, how they turned out and how they surprised um, the directors and, and how, wow, you that, that, <laughs> really wasn't expecting that, but awesome. Yeah. 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 That sort of feeling, um, you know, a couple in uh, spies in disguise. So it's, it's that sort of rewarding feeling that you get that you, you, you know, lived up to the the expectations if if not you know going behind beyond them a little bit um and just yeah made made your director's job easier gotcha gotcha okay so now outside of animation what are some of the other things that you enjoy doing hobby whatever i i, I like to ride my bike <laughs> oh yeah there it is in the background yeah nice i like to ride it in the in the real world outside too but Pretty cold right now in New York. Northeast. Yeah, it's getting more <laughs> spring. Today's a nice spring like day. All right, all right. All spring. You can't fall for it. Okay. <laughs> It'll get cold and probably snow. We haven't had much snow. But yeah, bike riding. Um, yeah, I really like the outdoors and uh, basically going to see my kids' games. <laughs> things like I, that. I know your daughter plays volleyball. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your son. He was a. a on the soccer team. Soccer, soccer okay. Player. He's in uh, college now, but uh, okay. yeah, he uh, still plays when he gets a chance. Good deal. Uh, but yeah, uh, Roxanne's going to be a senior next year. A big, big volleyball year. So. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Well, Ron, I really appreciate your time on this podcast. It's been fun to, like I said, to, to hear your, your background, your story, but it was really, really cool to get to work with you on the Wing Feather Saga. I'm looking forward to season two. Um, if you've not, like I said, checked out these books and the animated series, it is out on angel.com and YouTube. You can check those out for free. Um, but yeah, definitely check out the books. Really very fun stories. So um, again, thank you, uh, Ron, for your time and just uh, the lead on the project. So My pleasure. Thank you. All right. And with that, we are out.